The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Scripture to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll be... I hear Bibles opening. What's going on? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23. We'll be reading through chapter 11, verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own, for why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, give us ears to hear. Ears to hear your words and not mine. Words that call us ever on, ever deeper into this life of faith. A life spent totally and completely following you. Help us to hear you speak now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm uh, 33 going on 60, it feels like sometimes. Um, But I feel like for most of my life, well, not feel like, for most of my life, I've been a student, uh, 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 a kid or an adult in some sort of class. And it all started way back in ancient history, in 1989. In 1989, uh, we lived in a little town outside of Enterprise called Daleville, Alabama. We lived in a little housing project there. And I started going to school at Wyndham Elementary School, and Miss Webb was my kindergarten teacher. Now, I remember a few things about kindergarten. I remember that, that the Noid, you all know what the Noid is? Did they have that up here for Domino's Pizza? I don't know what it was. It looked kind of like a mutant rabbit. It was sort of red. I remember the Noid came to see us at school one day. I remember getting in trouble because I punched a kid in the stomach on the playground after watching a Steven Seagal movie and thought it looked cool. Um, Which, by the way, I mean, if you like him, I don't think there's much about Steven Seagal these days. It's cool. Um, But I also remember Ms. Webb giving us uh, uh, an assignment. Now, you've probably heard me tell the story about coloring the pig, but this is different. She gave us a coloring assignment, and she said, Now, listen, class, I don't remember... Why? She may not have been. Our memories tend to remember things differently. But she sounded, in my memory, upset, ill, frustrated at the class. She gave us a little coloring sheet, and she said, When you hand it back, I don't want to see any white spots left on the page. Now, what she meant was, she wanted us to color the whole thing. But see, I I didn't, when I colored in kindergarten, I colored with uh, whatever uh, crayons they sold down at the Family Dollar. And when I was coloring, they didn't make a solid line like a marker. When I would draw a line, there'd be little white flecks in the line. And I remember coloring, and I thought, oh, no, there are white spots all over the sheet of paper. And so I colored harder. Still more white spots. Colored harder. I'd colored so much until I'd worn down a crayon to a nub, and the page was, felt like it was eight times as thick from crayon. And when the time was over, I turned it in, and Miss Webb, I remember she was frustrated. Chris, I said, no white spots left on the page. Now, I don't think I cried. Maybe. 
So I said, Miss Webb, I tried so hard. The color in my crayons kept leaving the little white spots. I took her words that she said, perhaps to their most ridiculous, literal extent. We do that sometimes when someone gives us a command, tells us to do something. Uh, sometimes it's absurd, like if, like if you're a parent and you tell your kid, pick everything up off the floor, and then you go in there and they set the toy box up on the dresser, the bed's turned over, right? I've tried to get it all off the floor. But this is something that was happening for, for the Apostle Paul in the church at Corinth. Now, you can see how this would get carried away, right? I mean, think about Paul's preaching. What Paul was saying when he went around preaching was, it's not about works anymore, it's about grace. It's about faith. You can't do anything, it's all about God's grace. And you can imagine how some folks would take that, right? I can't do anything. It's not about what I do. It's about what God does, it's about God. So that means I can do whatever I want. Whatever I want. And so some of the Corinthians were doing that. In fact, they, they developed what we call Corinthian slogans. They had these little phrases they would say to sort of justify things that they did. Uh, chapter 6 is, is quite full of them, actually, in 1 Corinthians. But we get one here in chapter 10. All things are lawful. That, if you've got a, a more contemporary translation, you might notice that phrase is set off with quotation marks. All things are lawful. It's one of the Corinthian slogans. And some of the Christians at Corinth had taken Paul's words to their most sort of absurd extent. Well, if it's all about grace and not about works, it's not about the law, then all things must be lawful. It sent the Corinthian church into chaos. And so Paul is trying to write to them, and he's using this example. It's a hot topic at Corinth about eating meat sacrificed to idols. And as Paul is sort of trying to straighten them out on this, Paul begins to sort of say, well, it's not just about meat sacrificed to idols. It's really about everything. About our whole life of faith. As I thought about that, and as I thought about questions we've been asking, I started thinking, what if, what if we saw everything that we do as a part of our life of faith? That every work we did is work for the kingdom. Every action we took is action for God's kingdom. What if we saw everything we do as a part of a life of faith? It's the message Paul is trying to get across to the Corinthians. What if we saw a life of faith as one that requires more than a few boiled down bullet points, more than a few catchphrases, more than just some bumper sticker slogan? I thought about this uh, last week uh, as, as Dr. Willits was here, Sally and I were driving back home uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, trying to get ahead of what we were certain was utter doom coming with Tropical Storm Nate, right? And we're coming down I-65 uh, through Kentucky, which is a beautiful drive if you haven't done it. It's really, really beautiful. And I remember at one point looking over on the left-hand side of the interstate, and there was this big green billboard. And just one word on that big green billboard, J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus. That's what it said. Maybe it said Jesus, but I'm pretty sure it said Jesus. Jesus, one word on a green billboard. And I remember I asked Sally, I said, what do you think the person who's paying for that billboard is trying to communicate. To boil it all down, I mean, if you can boil it down, to boil it down to Jesus is pretty good, but it can't communicate everything, right? It doesn't tell us everything about what Christ calls us to do. It's open for our own wild interpretations. Or I think about, I think about my friends in college. When I went to seminary, they went to seminary in other places, like Southern Seminary in Louisville or Gordon-Conwell up in New England or even Beeson Divinity School on campus at Samford. They called themselves Calvinists. They said they were five-point Calvinists. The five points spell the word tulip, T-U-L-I-P. Total depravity, unconditional salvation, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Sounds nice, right? I can still remember it, and I'm not a Calvinist. But John Calvin himself would probably roll over in his grave if he thought, gosh, they boiled it down to five points? Five things? And that sums up all the faith? No. 
Or what about this one? I, I've seen this bumper sticker, and maybe you have too. I remember seeing it once down Quintard Avenue. Somebody had it on the back of their car. The Bible says it. I believe it. Do you know the rest of it? That settles it. No, it doesn't. If it settled it, you wouldn't need a bumper sticker to tell everybody. You can't boil it all down to just a nice little saying. This one usually boils Baptist down a little bit, right? Once saved, always saved. That sums it all up. No, we can't sum it all up in these nice little sayings to put in our pockets or on the bumper stickers of our car or on our bookmarks in our Bibles. There's so much more. And this is what the Corinthians were doing, right? Trying to make these nice little sayings to carry around, to have with them, to say, this is what faith is about. All things are lawful. This was one of those sayings, one of those slogans, likely used to justify behavior unfit for a follower of Christ. And so Paul calls them out on it. Because the truth is, we can't boil this life of faith down. This wide, complex calling of Christ into a life of faith, into these simple ideas and handy sentences and slogans. And when we do, here's the truth. It's often for our own benefit that we do it. It's for our own gain. I've never seen a bumper sticker, never, that said, and the Lord said, sell all of your possessions and give it away. I haven't seen one of those yet. I haven't. I don't think I'd even want to put it on my car, to be honest with you. It's usually for our own gain. And the truth is, we do the same thing when it comes to how we give of ourselves to the church, when we give of ourselves to one another. I was having a conversation with uh, another friend. She's a minister. We were talking. This was several weeks ago. I was telling her, yeah, our church is about to pay off some debt, and I'm doing this sort of stewardship sermon series kind of thing. And she said to me, she goes, yeah, my husband and I feel bad about that. We don't actually tithe to our church. Now we tithe, she said, because that's important to tithe, but we give some to, to the missionary friends we know. We give some to the local hospital. We give some to our university. But all in all, it's 10%. And I remember thinking, you're hung up on that, right? That 10, 10%. We do it. We boil it down. to If we can do this, then it's good. If we have this saying, if we have this one little expression, and saying that we don't have law, what we've done is we've made our own laws for ourselves. Or I remember when I was pastoring in another town, talking to a, a fellow one time, he said, yeah, I said, how often do you read your Bible when you're at home? How often do you pray? Oh, I don't, I don't need to do that. So you don't need to? You got it figured out? He said, no, no, I go to church on Sunday morning. I come on Sunday night. I come on Wednesday night. I come when we have our little gatherings on Wednesday afternoon. I get enough church. I get enough. As if you could could just sort of meter it out during the week. That's what we do. We sort of boil it down to if we can do these things, these expressions, whether they are are voiced in slogans or not, it's what we do. But Paul says to the church at Corinth and to us that a life of faith, it, it requires more than that, boiling it down to just a few handy sentences. What Paul says, and this is the whole truth of it, is that A life of faith requires putting the improvement and concern of others far ahead of ourselves. I think about that when I think think about the first first real job I ever had. I was 16 and got a job in the Chevy dealership in my hometown in Enterprise and got to work in the shop for the first week until they went and looked over the insurance papers and realized, oh, we can't let a miner work on other people's cars. So I'd start sweeping. But I remember Dwayne, I was working with a guy named Dwayne. He was the transmission guy, brilliant guy, man. He could, he could pull the transmission out of a car, tear it apart, put it back together, and put it back in before lunch. It was amazing. And I was asking him one day, I said, Dwayne, I've noticed something. In the shop, we're all working on these cars, getting customers' cars back together. Everything looks nice, good. I mean, we, we, we do a great job. These are great mechanics. But I look out in the parking lot, and man, there are oil stains under everybody's car. Some people got bald tires. I noticed the other day we had to push off yours. Why is it that mechanics' cars are always the biggest pieces of junk? And he said, well, we spend all day working on other people's cars. When we get home, the wife's car has something wrong with it. Son's car's got something wrong with it. Somebody's waiting in the driveway. Hey, Dwayne, I know you're a mechanic. Can you help me out? We will put everybody else's junk heap before ours. And ours just gets a little more wore out, a little more wore out, and theirs gets fixed. 
I never thought I'd imagine a bunch of mechanics sort of exemplifying what Christ calls us to do. To put others ahead of ourselves. I mean, Paul says this to the Corinthians, right? He says, this is what you're doing with these slogans concerned about all these other things. It's really you're putting yourself ahead of someone else. Especially when it came to this sacrificing, this eating meat sacrificed to idols. What was happening is they would show up at a stranger's house and they'd say, oh, before, before we get to supper, I need to know, has this meat been offered to idols? Because I don't eat that stuff. Now that's a little out of, out of our context, but imagine this. Imagine it's Thanksgiving. You've invited some stranger over to your home to share in your Thanksgiving meal. You bring out the turkey. Maybe you've roasted it in the oven. Maybe you've deep fried it. Maybe you've smoked it, but you bring it out. You sit it on the table, and before you say grace, they raise their hand. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Is that an organic, cage-free, non-hormone-given bird? Because I can't, I can't eat, uh, I, I just can't eat a processed butter bowl. I mean, it'd be rude, right? It's putting their needs, their convictions, their conscience ahead of yours. Paul says, you don't do that. Now, if they came out and said, well, listen right here, she's full of hormones and I killed her this morning. You might say, well, I, I don't know, my stomach, you know. Paul says, you don't do it for yourself. You put their concerns, theirs ahead of yours. In fact, he says the very thing. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. That'd be a pretty good slogan. Do not seek the advantage of yourself, but that of others. Before we strive to sort of find these own luxuries in our own lives, to find where we can do our better thing, we're called to be sure that others have the necessities of life, that others are, are, are put ahead of us way before we think about ourselves. And this is especially true in our lives of faith. Before we strive for the sort of piety and self-righteousness that lets us look down our Bibles at people, Jesus says to lift them up. Care for them. Help them to feel worthy. And here's the, the kicker of all this, right? This isn't just a one-time thing. Paul says this is a life of faith. What if we thought about everything we do as work for the kingdom because our entire life, our entire life is a life of faith? Not just one or two hours a week. Now, I know none of you are like this, but I remember several years ago, uh, I had a family come into my office. They were in the community, and they came to me and said, our, 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 our father died suddenly, and we don't go to church, and he doesn't really go to church, but we need somewhere to have the funeral, and we were wondering if, if you could do, if you could kind of officiate the funeral. Yeah, I'm sorry for your loss, absolutely sure. We opened the church Saturday, no visitation, just going to be a small little gathering, they said, for family. I came in the sanctuary door that morning, and I noticed, I came in to sort of make sure, you know, there weren't any flowers in the way, because sometimes they'll put them where you can't get around, or to make sure everything was where it needed to be. And I came in, and, and on the communion table, it was pretty simple. They'd had him cremated, there was just an urn, and on top of the urn was a houndstooth hat. And on the other side of the table, one of those paintings you see in a sports bar from some Iron Bowl victory way back when, some player for Alabama dodging a tackle from some player from Auburn. And there was only one flower arrangement. It's crimson and white roses in the shape of a cursive A on one side of the communion table. Three other people spoke at that funeral, family members. I don't know if he was married. I don't know how many kids he had. I don't know what he did for a living. I don't know even what he died from. But you know what I do know? He loved Alabama football. Every person, every person who stood in that pulpit, instead of saying amen, do you know what they said? Roll Tide. Every one of them. Now Auburn fans are laughing, but you know there's someone to do the same thing. It's easy for us to do that with other parts of our lives, isn't it? 
Oh, yeah, he was. And it's not just Auburn and Alabama football. I'm sure there are Pittsburgh Steelers funerals. I'm sure there are, you can buy a Kiss coffin. I'm sure there are people who were buried with Gene Simmons having his mouth wide open over his dead head. <laughs> because they grew up their whole lives loving kids. We can do it with so many things in our lives. People will know. It's always, it's always a little confusing, a little, a little convicting to me when I have a conversation with somebody sitting in the doctor's office. They find out. I want to tell you something. Ministers hate telling people what we do. We do. Nurses, I'm sure you're probably the same way because they all got something wrong with them they want you to look at. But when you're a minister, oh, they either want to tell you their theology or when you tell them where you're from, they go, oh, yeah, I know so and so. Do you know, do they go to, I've never seen them. They say they go to your church. I've never seen them. Or if I say, oh, well, do you know so-and-so? They go, yeah, they go to church. <laughs> it's amazing to me how there are things about our lives that can so consume us, they become our identity. But so often, even here in what we love to proclaim as the Bible Belt, it is rarely, rarely, that we put it in little compartments. We put it in little places. You say, well, I'll be religious from 9 to 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Maybe 5.30 to 6.30 on Wednesday night. Maybe for 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes before I go to bed. Maybe when I'm sitting at struts and I see somebody that knows me and before I eat my buffalo chicken, I'm going to bow my head and say a quick prayer. Maybe. But when people know you, do they say, yeah, that person loved Jesus. They committed their whole lives to Jesus. Paul wraps this whole section up, and it's just about eating meat offered to idols, but it's so much more. He wraps the whole thing up with a phrase we've heard, I'm sure, many times. So whether you eat or drink, and Paul means literally. He says, whether you eat the meat that's been sacrificed to idols or just opt for the side salad, whether you have the water with lemon or they bring a pitcher of margaritas to the table, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything. That word everything, there's no exception in it. It's the Greek word panta. It means all Everything. You can't get around it. Not all the religious stuff. Not all the stuff you do on Sunday. Not all the stuff you do when people are watching. Everything for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. There is no room in that sentence. No room in that text to say, well, some stuff. Now here's the thing. It's easy to hear that passage, to hear that sentence and go, I can't. Because I'm sure you're like me and there are days when you lay your head down on the pillow and go, I just wasn't, I, I didn't have it today. I wasn't a Christian today. Days when you think about that argument you had with somebody, that thing you did, that, that mistake you made, I just didn't do it today. I think it's why Paul says to the Corinthians, imitate me as I try to imitate Christ. Because if we always say, imitate Jesus, what are we going to say? That's Jesus. I can't do that. And some of us are tempted to say, well, that's Paul. Paul ain't nothing but one of us. Paul's just like you and just like me. You can't read the New Testament and see where Paul doesn't have some really messed up ways of thinking and some messed up things he says. Paul is just like you and me. We can call him St. Paul if you want, but I know some other saints in my life, too, that walk around. And I'd put them on a higher pedestal than I might put Paul. So Paul says, imitate me as I'm trying to imitate Jesus. It's why Jesus says, come and follow me. He never says, come stand where I'm standing. Come follow me. So what if, what if what but Paul, what Jesus, what all of God is calling us to is to reorient our whole lives in such a way to where every decision we make, the one question we ask above all else is, is this to the glory of God? Is what I'm doing, what I'm about to do, what I'm thinking of doing, what I'm planning, is this for God's glory or is it for mine? Is this for the advancement, for the comfort, for the good of someone else? Or is it for the good of me? Paul says this is what a life of faith is. 
reorienting everything we do, think, and feel to where Christ and Christ's kingdom is at its center. You won't figure it out today. You won't figure it out tomorrow. And hopefully, when it's a long time from now and either I'm really old or someone else is here and we're all gathered in this room and your box or your urn is sitting at the front, I hope that then, then whoever the preacher is, me or someone else will say, I don't know what college football team they pulled for. I don't know what they did during the week. I don't know what their career was. I don't know how many kids they, I don't know. But what I do know is they sought first the needs of others. They sought first the kingdom of God. They sought first to love and follow Jesus. I pray that's what they say about me. I pray it's what I or someone else is to say about you. For it's what Christ calls us to. A life where we ask ourselves, what if everything we do is for the kingdom of God? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, when there are things in our lives for which we are known more than our love for you. Help us, Lord, with each day to walk closer to you, to pursue that calling you've placed on us, Lord, we know we may not get there, but God, help us to draw closer, to always pursue you. For Lord, we know that you are always calling after us. So Holy Spirit, move in this time that we have now. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to make whatever decisions we need to make for you and your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.